Okay, welcome to the second half of today's program, which is called Brain Game, Exercises, Techniques, and Strategies for Mental Fitness. So Rabbi Davis gave us a few suggestions, and now we're going to hear from the experts. Our presenter is Elise November, LCSW, who is a social, work in, social worker in private practice. She has extensive experience working with the elderly, children with special needs, and their families. Her social work agency, Difference Like Me, provides in-home psychotherapy services to patients in Palm Beach and Broward counties with a specialization in the elderly population. She is the founder of Brain Lane Memory Center, LLC, a company in Delray Beach that provides resources to patients and families who have been affected by memory disorders. We welcome her today with her husband, who is a neuropsychologist. So the two of them together, and we thank you so much for being here, and I'm sure they're going to tell us a lot of things that we won't forget. <laughs> Hi, thank you so much for having me. I'd like to introduce my husband and partner, Dr. Stephen Essig. Um, it, we are lucky enough to have him here today that he's not seeing any patients this morning. So hopefully the two of our brains combined will help all of your brains. So today we're going to talk about brain games and I know you want to learn all these strategies and techniques that will help you remember and learn new material and we're going to cover all of that. But I also felt that if I didn't give you a background on the brain and how it works, as we heard towards the end, the rabbi was talking about a little bit, and a lot of you had really good questions. In addition to some other things that you can do, I'd only be giving you one-fifth of the puzzle. So I'm gonna give you the whole puzzle, the rest of it briefly, and then the brain games a little bit more extensively. Okay. Okay, so first, as I said, we're going to talk about the brain a little bit, and I'm going to hand the mic over to my husband, Dr. Essig, who's going to, he's, he's the expert on the brain, so. I was told I was just here to schlep the computer and everything. <laughs> I didn't know I was speaking. Um, so we're going to, we're just going to really give a very brief overview about how the brain works. It's obviously a very complex and much more uh, in-depth um, issue than, than what we're able to cover here today. The cortex is the covering of the brain. It's the outer part of the brain. It's where, the, it's where most of the work that we think about takes place, uh, higher level functionings. Um, it's where it, there are different lobes of the brain. The frontal lobe is associated with movement, but also with reasoning and planning, what we think of as higher level functions. Uh, other lobes are the parietal lobes, uh, are associated with um, orientation, movement, recognition, perception, occipital lobe is back here, it's, it's involved in visual perception, and then the temporal lobes, uh, which are involved with um, auditory, taking in and, and recognizing and associating auditory stimuli, but most importantly to what we're talking about today, the temporal lobes are integral to memory. Um, I'm not sure if there's a slide about this, but let me touch on something the rabbi mentioned a little while ago. The difference between short-term and long-term memory. As we get older, and someone made this point, as we get older, our memory functioning does decline because, as the rabbi correctly pointed out, brain cells, just like cells throughout the rest of the body, don't function as well, and some of them die as we get older. Now, someone in the audience also mentioned brain games, and that's why we're here today, because we can, in fact, create new, new connections within the brain. That's a big part of what Elise is going to be talking about. Um, the cortex, though, is where higher level functions of our thinking processes, including memory, take place. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. Um, the right half of the brain and the left half of the brain are designed to do different things. But in essence, the left half of the brain controls the right side of the body and vice versa. And then, as pointed out here, the right half thinks about abstract things like music, shapes, and the left half is more analytical, more involved with logic, speech, uh, and verbal information. Now, the hippocampus is a very important part of the brain. It's, con it's inside of the, the temporal lobes, which are on the, on the side of your brain. And in essence, the hippocampus is the area of the brain that allows us 
to take information from short-term memory and store it in long-term memory. What's the difference? Short-term memory is now. It's a few seconds from now. It's a couple of minutes from now. Long-term memory is what someone was talking about before, remembering what, what, what Bubby used to make for dinner on shows, <laughs> remembering who we went to school with, remembering what happened a year ago. Those are the kind of things that before we start to develop memory problems, get entrenched, and someone mentioned that the brain is like a computer, that what gets stuck, what gets put into the computer typically stays in the computer, and that's true unless we have a disease process that, that destroys that. The problem as we get older is that the hippocampus doesn't work as well, so getting information from short-term memory, new information from short-term memory into long-term memory can be a problem. It's a part of normal aging, and Lisa's gonna talk about this, it's a part of normal aging, but there are disease processes that are involved that can be pathological, and we can have pathological changes and, and uh, pathological changes to our ability to form new memories. Okay, so let's talk about what's normal and what's not. And also, you know what I forgot? I forgot to point out that in your handouts, the page right after that front page is a notes page that kind of follows along to the presentation. So if you want to take notes or, you know, we all need to write down things to remember. So if you want to write something down, I gave you a little outline there on that front page. So, and then the rest of it is just brain games and different things that you can do. But, okay, so what's normal? Normal memory changes, they start with slower thinking. Sometimes we have difficulty paying attention to things, like my kids call me a squirrel, okay? What's a squirrel? It's like, what, what, where? You know, you're onto one thing and then you're onto the next thing and you're like, wait, oh my God, I forgot. I was in the middle of making the bed and then the phone rang and then I had something boiling on the stove and the bed got lost, okay? So we have, if we multitask, we have difficulty paying attention. We need more cues like words or pictures or smells. Who, how many here go, Wait, what's that word, that word, right? We all do it, all do it. Okay, so this is normal. Visualization and organization become more difficult. Figuring out where to put things. Who here has piles? I'm a piler, okay? So figuring out how to organize things become more difficult, okay? And associations are more difficult. Okay. So normal now versus abnormal. Okay, so normal is forgetting part of an experience. Abnormal is forgetting the entire experience. When I work with my caregivers with Alzheimer's, with family members who have a memory disorder, and they get so upset because they say, well, it just happened. And why don't they remember that it just happened? And they're not telling the story the way it happened. The way I explain it to them, it's like a sheet cake. Okay, and what happens is, is we cut out the middle of the sheet cake, we take it out, throw it in the garbage, and the two ends get pushed back together. That chunk of time is gone. It's not there anymore. There's nothing you can do to bring it back to them. It's just not there. They weren't able to store it in their long-term memory. Okay, so normal versus abnormal. We forget things, but when somebody brings it up, you're like, oh yeah, I remember that. Okay, so that's normal. Able to follow directions. Somebody with a memory disorder just can't get it together to do maybe pass one or maybe two step directions. Using notes and a calendar, somebody, we all, I think as we age, it's good to write everything down um, and keeping the notes in the calendar and being able to go back and look at it. But people with a memory disorder, they can't get it together to be able to do that. Able to care for yourself even with memory lapses and people with memory disorder more in the later stages are not really able to take care of themselves. Okay, so uh, a little bit about Alzheimer's disease. Um, about, currently more than five million people in the US have Alzheimer's. By the year 2050, they're expecting that the number will almost triple to 14 million. Now, I'm not saying this to scare you, but I'm saying this also, pay attention to what I say. 
in terms of when we get into what you can do, because we have a slide and I'll just talk about it now, is when, if you adopt one behavior, they say you really reduce your risk of getting it. Or if you're not gonna, if you're gonna get it anyway, you can push it back years, hopefully. Okay, so I'm not gonna go over the rest of this to scare you, but it, it's, I'm sure everybody in here knows somebody or has seen somebody with it. So it's rising at alarming rates and we wanna do something to stop it. Okay, so what happens to the changes in the, in the brain? And I, I'm not gonna go over this whole slide, but what I wanna talk about, and I think I just spoke about this, is the lifestyle issues. That's what makes a difference. If you're gen genetically disposed or ready to get a memory disorder, it might already be there. But if you make lifestyle changes, as I just said, you can make a difference in your life, whether it's the progression of it, or whether it's when it's gonna start, or even if you're not predisposed, but you're gonna get it anyway, to maybe have you just not get it. I'm gonna tell you. <laughs> we, have a whole, we have a little bit of time. Okay, so let's talk about your risk factors. I think I heard the rabbi say, the major risk factor is age. We get older. When you get older, that's your major risk factor. So the only alternative to that is not dying, I guess, and we don't wanna do that, okay? So we're all gonna get older. That's the major risk factor. Next is genetics, okay? If you have these genes and People go get tested to see if they have it. Sometimes if you have a family member who has it, you might be more at risk. Um, you might not be. You don't necessarily have to. Um, hypertension, high blood pressure. So you wanna make sure you keep it under control. Bad cholesterol, those triglycerides, those tricky things, you wanna make sure that you keep that under control as well. That's a risk factor. Diabetes, type two. Obesity, chronic stress, who has a little bit of that, right? Um, smoking, and metabolic syndrome, which incorporates a lot of that in there. So if you have any of those things that are not under control, that's something you can take control of and take care of it, okay? So these are the things that you can take care of. The high blood pressure, the poor nutrition, Depression, anxiety, we're gonna talk a little bit about mood disorders and how that contributes. Lack of sleep is huge. Stress, inactivity, sitting and not doing anything, blood sugar issues, and overuse of drugs or alcohol. Okay, so this is that slide I was talking about. There's a study in UCLA that showed that if we adopt one healthy habit, the number of expected cases of Alzheimer's disease would drop by one million in five years and six million by the year 2050. Well, I wanna be a part of that statistic, not the other statistic, okay? So if you just take away one thing and you work on that one thing consistently, you're doing something. Hopefully you'll take away five. Okay, so there's, I'm gonna get a drink. <laughs> So there's something called neuroplasticity. I learned it from this guy over here. Okay, so what that means basically is that, you know like when your mother used to say, like, don't get hit in the head or, right? Because you'll lose those brain cells or, you know, I guess way back when in the hippie ages when people used to do all those drugs and smoke the pot or whatever and they say you lose all the brain cells. Well, that's not true because the brain does regenerate itself. It's called neuroplasticity. Okay, so when the brain cells die, the connections between the brain cells are lost. But if the connections that allow us to do things and remember things, and the brain has the ability to recruit other brain cells to make those connections. So what we're talking about today in these brain games, that will help you make those new brain cells. Do you want to say okay. What we're talking about here is reducing risk factors. Alzheimer's, for, for developing of Alzheimer's disease. Alzheimer's disease is thought to be an inflammatory disease process. 
all of the things that Elise has mentioned, reducing hypertension, diabetes, tends to reduce inflammation in the body and in the brain. So the thought is that by reducing this inflammation, what we're doing is we're reducing the risk of developing what are called amyloid proteins in the brain, these sticky proteins that lead to cell death. What neuroplasticity involves is the use of the brain, use of remaining cells, and the brain is also, there are studies that show that the brain is also capable, even as we get older, the brain is capable of creating new brain cells, especially in the area of the hippocampus. By doing the things that, we're, that Elise is talking about today, these activities, these brain games, by using your brain, by doing things with your brain, what you're doing is you're recruiting these brain cells and creating new connections within the brain from one cell to the next to the next. And that's how we develop and, and retain as much ability as we can. The brain is able to retain as much ability, including, we hope, memory functioning for as long as possible. It is not a cure. There is no cure for Alzheimer's. And there is no definitive way to prevent it. But by reducing risk factors, as Elise has mentioned, you can delay the onset of it, you can delay the severity of it, and you can delay the speed of it. Okay, so what types of things can we do in our day-to-day -day lives to help reduce the risk factor, help reduce our risk of developing a memory disorder? And these are the different areas that the Lisa and I are gonna discuss. But in essence, we're talking about nutrition, we're talking about physical exercise and activity, social stimulation, reduced stress and improved mood, so psychological factors, cognitive stimulation, which is a lot about what these brain games we're gonna be talking about involve, and getting sleep. Sleep is, is a, uh, an anti-inflammatory process. So, this is a, a slide, there's lots of information on here. I'm not gonna go through the whole, this but isn't can a- Can repeat that again from the back? We can't see it clearly. I just, this, this slide, I'm just saying I'm not going to go through all of the details of this slide on diet and nutrition. There are lots of books out there, there are lots of information. This is not a lecture about, about nutrition and Alzheimer's disease. What I will tell you is what someone mentioned before, a Mediterranean diet, leafy greens, olive oil, antioxidants, all are thought to reduce inflammation and therefore reduce the risk of developing a memory disorder. Um, so rather than going through all of this, I would suggest that if people are interested in um, finding out about nutrition and about nutritional ways to reduce risk factors, we do have a nutritionist on staff at Brain Lane. You're welcome to contact us for a consultation. We'll put you in touch with our nutritionist. But there are also lots of books out there and lots of information on the internet. But just keep in mind, a Mediterranean diet is thought to be a very significant way of reducing risk factor for development of um, Alzheimer's disease and memory disorder. And I think what you were asking before, we're gonna go over each category, and um, so you'll, you'll see what it is. So that slide that you were asking about before, so nutrition was the first thing on the slide. It was the risk factors. It was, oh, the risk factor yeah. slide. And you know what you can do is, my email I think is on there, and if it's not, you just, I'll give you my cell phone number, you have our office number, you could call me if you have any questions. So I think we'll cover it all. You know what, we were asked to speak for an hour. This lecture could be three days, <laughs> okay? It really can because there's so much information. And I know we were here, I want, to, I want to get to that brain game part that everybody came for, but like I said in the beginning, I didn't feel like I would be doing it justice if I just gave you the one piece. So like Dr. Asik said, the, a Mediterranean diet, high in fruits and vegetables, whole grains, fish, legumes, okay? If all of that fights the inflammation, so, if everybody here, if you have a computer, if you don't have a computer, go to the library and, and just Google, you know, what types of foods 
fight inflammation because that's what you want to do. Low in saturated fats, right? You want to eat lean meat, all the everything that's healthy for us, the chicken fat that all of our parents used to eat. No, no, not anymore. It's not good for you. It's just so fatty. Okay. So what? I know, and it's so good. <laughs> but you know what? If you're going to eat it, limit it. Limit it. And, and then use the good fats. Use that olive oil. And you know, are, are we all allowed to eat coconut oil? Yes. Okay. So listen, something that I just learned yesterday. I have a patient with Asperger's who came into my office yesterday, and he said, so what do you know about Asperger's and um, coconut oil. So I, he wanted to take a few minutes of his session and we kind of Googled it on the internet and looked it up together. So what I learned is it's so beneficial for Alzheimer's. And I didn't have enough time yesterday to do the research to bring it all to you here, but coconut oil, um, there's, I was reading, there's two sides of it. One says it's high in fat and it's not good for you, but the other side says that it's really healthy that it kills candida in the body, so it helps with weight loss. They said that it actually, for people, they're doing studies now, people with autism and um, Alzheimer's, and it shows that it does something with the ketones, that it works on the brain chemistry and it actually helps. So I had, my son has, my other son has, my son has juvenile diabetes, so I had a mom-to-mom -mom night last night at my house so one of the moms was saying, oh yeah, my mom had Alzheimer's disease and I take a teaspoon of that every day and I cook with it instead of the other oils. So I'm not making any promotions here, I'm not selling coconut oil, but it's definitely something to research. So just passing along the information. One very important thing is because I've, <coughs> I've been taking coconut oil for at least four or five years. Uh, very important that you get organic, pure, coconut oil, not just any yes. coconut oil. Yes, and extra virgin, extra they virgin, said. Extra virgin, virgin, organic, pure. So that's, so do your own research and see what's out there that will help you. So <laughs> olive oil too, extra virgin, yes. And make sure, because there's so many synthetics on the market, you wanna make sure that it's good for you and they're not putting junk in it. Okay, so exercise now. <laughs> Okay, so just briefly about exercise. Who here exercises regularly? Good, that's great. Very good, okay? That, so when we were doing research a while ago for a, a, a study, that would, for, for a, a presentation, we learned, I learned, I read this article that says 30 minutes of exercise, walking, whatever, every day in this study increases the size of the hippocampus. Well, that's what's affected with Alzheimer's. So who doesn't want a bigger head than campus? So if you think about it, and I'm gonna give you some different things that you can do. I mean, even if it's gardening, even if it's just taking a walk outside, parking your car at the end of the parking lot and walking, even just that, mall walking, whatever you wanna do. Okay, so they say aim for at least 30 minutes of aerobic exercise five times per week, Obviously, it's permitting as far as what your medical conditions are, but if you could do it, do it. Walking, swimming, or anything else that gets you up, and your heart rate up. Okay, and they say here, gardening, cleaning, fire your cleaning lady. Save money, and then save your brain cells, right? Okay. So all of that counts as exercise. Okay, so they also say, in addition to that, that pumping iron. Now we all don't have to be the big muscle builders, but if you think about it, even if you take a jug of milk, you don't have to go out and buy weights. Get a jug of milk, or get, depending upon your strength, get a couple of heavy cans of tomatoes or tomato juice, and just use that a couple of times a day. Or you could do wall push-ups, you can, whatever your body will allow you to do. They say that the cardiovascular, in addition to some strength building, helps. Okay, balance and coordination. That kind of regulates the both sides of the brain. So the balance and coordination issues, um, exercises help. Uh, they, who here has heard that study about um, the football players, right? Has anybody heard about the football players? Okay, and they're saying, right? And think about the boxers and everybody that get hit in the head. 
And my last slide is they're more at risk because head injury, you're more at risk. So you wanna, you wanna um, increase your balance exercises so that you're less at risk for falling. Okay, and then how to be consistent. How to be consistent. We all have our own little ways of doing things and it's very easy to fall off the wagon. We're all gung-ho at first to do something, but how do you stick with it? Okay, they say it, it takes approximately 28 days for something to become a habit. So commit to it, mark it on your calendar. I tell my patients, schedule it in. Schedule it in like a doctor's appointment. And no matter how much you don't wanna do it, do it. I got up this morning and I went on my elliptical. I really, honestly, all I wanna do is stay in bed. I don't wanna get up early, but you have to force yourself. It's a commitment to yourself to be healthy and to be the best that you can be, okay? Okay, and we were, I was just talking about this. Protect your head, so if you're riding a bike, make sure you wear a helmet. If you're doing anything that involves any type of activity where you could possibly get hurt, make sure you wear a helmet, because that is, um, they're doing a whole bunch of studies now on the football players and the people who have uh, engaged in sports where they've gotten head injuries, and they're much more at risk for Alzheimer's. Okay, so a little bit about socialization. Okay, so who here is more of a loner? Likes to kind of be by themselves. We got one guy in the back. My son's kind of a loner. You guys too, okay? It's okay, but then let's talk, let's talk about how you could socialize. Some people are just highly social and they walk into a room and they just feel super comfortable, okay? Some people have, you know, they're on the phone talking to this one and that one all the time. Some people aren't, but they say that socialization is important. So even if it doesn't have to, you don't have to have the gift of gab, just even to get out, if you're mentally socializing, sit in the park and watch kids play. That's mentally socializing. And maybe a kid will come over to you or maybe somebody will trip and fall and you'll say, are you okay, sweetie? That's socializing. Sit just in your common area out here in your clubhouse and maybe you'll see somebody or somebody will smile at you. That's socializing, okay? Better to engage if you can, but if you're not one of those people, get it whatever way you can. It's so, so, so important. Maybe also might be easier for you to join a club, so this way it's not necessarily socializing, but it's getting involved in something for a cause. Okay, going out with your friends. Maybe there's just a t uh, the, the library, and I'm sure here they offer just topics of discussion like this. So even coming to something like this is socializing. <clears throat> okay, but they say it's really, really important. It actually decreases the risk of getting Alzheimer's. So it says there's a study that being socially engaged may, re may reduce your risk of getting dementia as much as 60%. Says chronically lonely people appear to have more chronic inflammation. So we're trying to reduce that inflammation. So the mood and everything, it helps. So, okay, so. Um, okay, so listen to this. This is kind of interesting, because now you could kill two birds with one stone. So one study reported that leisure activities that combine physical and mental and social activities are most likely to prevent dementia. So in the study of 800 men and women aged 75 and older, those who are more physically active and more mentally active and more socially engaged had a lower risk for developing dementia. So, okay, so if you go to the gym, maybe with somebody, that's what they're talking about. Go take a walk with somebody so you're walking and talking. So it's kind of like multitasking for your brain. Okay, so a little bit about mood disorders. I mean, mood disorders are very common in people, nothing ever to be embarrassed about, but some people have chemical changes in their brains that they can't control. Medication helps usually very well with that. And other people get depressed because of things that happen in their life. We'll call that more situational. And so we're just gonna talk a little bit about it because it's an important piece of this as well. Okay, so 
It says unrelieved chronic stress and mood disorders can reduce um, cognitive changes and inflammation in the brain. So you can have problems with thinking. You know, when we're all stressed, you can't think straight. You know, I know when my kids get me crazy in the morning, it's like, oh my God, if I, I have to have my badge right out in front because I would leave my head if it wasn't attached. You know, you can't think straight. Okay, you're more easily distracted, you become impatient. So what is stress? Who here can tell me what stress is? I don't need to read that. Go ahead, what's stress? Go ahead, somebody tell me what stress is. What's stress? Being overwhelmed. Yes, being overwhelmed with life, okay? Who here has felt that once in their life? Okay, who here still feels that sometimes on a daily basis, okay? Okay, so we all recognize that stress is a part of daily life. Some stress is good because it propels us to make good changes in our life. Some stress is chronic and something we can't do anything about. And that's the kind of stress that we're talking about where it's just nagging. Depression, okay? So I'm not getting, we all know kind of what depression is. Depression is just a feeling of sadness. Um, it just is, just kind of takes over sometimes and Lots of things could cause depression, grieving or just changes in lifestyle. You know, I retired and I thought that retirement was going to be amazing and it's not and whatever it is. But um, depression that's ongoing, that's untreated could also cause that inflammation. And anxiety, anxiety is kind of linked with that stress sometimes. And anxiety also can cause that inflammation in the brain. Okay, it's a normal human emotion, and everybody, most people have felt anxious or nervous about something, um, but anxiety disorders kind of linger on, and they sometimes become debilitating to people. Okay, so how do we change our, our mood? Okay, so since I'm a psychotherapist, that's like my thing. I always say talk it out. Go and talk to somebody. Friends are great to talk to, but it's not always the best thing because you know what friends give? They give advice. They give their opinion. The difference between talking to a friend and talking to a psychotherapist about a problem is I'm not going to give you my opinion. I'm going to help you figure out what your opinion is. I'm going to help you figure out how to move from that problem to, a, to resolution, to working towards figuring out how to be the best that you can be to find those coping skills that you feel that you've lost. So if anybody here has any chronic um, emotional problems, a psychotherapist, a good one, will help you really get through that. Should help you get through that. Okay, one slide about sleeping. Okay, Steve just mentioned that sleeping has an anti-inflammatory effect. Now if you're not sleeping, guess what's not happening? You're, the, the inflammation is not going down. When we sleep, the swelling in our brain goes down. But if you're not sleeping, then you're, the swelling isn't going to go down. So if you're not sleeping well at night and you're sleeping well during the day, we need to reverse you like a baby, right? Right? We need to change the baby sleeping habits to sleep at night. So go ahead. How do you do exactly that? How do you reverse it? You have to force yourself to stay awake. You have to force yourself to stay awake during the day. The time that you would normally take a nap go for a walk, engage yourself in something. You cannot be sitting on the couch and watching TV because you will fall asleep and there is no cure for that. What's wrong with a nap? A nap is okay, but if it's stopping you from sleeping at night, that's the problem. Okay, so a nap is great, but if you're not sleeping at night because you have your days and, mixed up, days and nights mixed up like you're a baby, that's where the problem comes in. And still sleep at night. That's great. Go for it. Go, I'm jealous. <laughs> what? What do you do? I don't know because I'm not a, a, a ENT, but you should probably see one if you snore a lot. Sometimes people have sleep apnea where they wake a lot during the night, and so that a doctor can help you with. Okay, so you want to avoid caffeine during the, later in the day if you're not sleeping well. You want to relax in the evening. Sometimes they say those. That if you're on the computer, it provides you with too much stimulation. So to do relaxing things at night. 
Okay, so now this is what you all came for. Okay, so as we said, the brain continues to make new cells. So now we're gonna play some games and I'm gonna show you a little bit about what to do. So the stimulation that you give yourself must be new and challenging. So who here is a knitter or a crocheter? Okay, that's not new or challenging. That you do automatically. Who here has never knitted or crocheted in their lives? That is new or challenging. Okay, you get it? You don't want to just do things. If you're used to doing a New York crossword, New York Times crossword puzzle in pen every day, although it's great, let's find something else for you to do. Can I ask a question? Yeah. But you know, you may take on this new activity and then get frustrated. And like, so you're back to where you were when you started, because now you're frustrated with a new activity. Well, but you don't want to do things to the point of frustration. If it's frustrating, then you're leading into stress. You want to do it to the point of it being challenging, and then you want to be able to pick it up again. But let me show you, because some of these things, although they seem like they can be frustrating, they actually can be fun. Okay. Reading the paper every day is a great cognitive activity. So I think what you're saying is to add this to whatever else you're doing, not to stop doing whatever you're doing. Right, add, add, right. We said we we're going to give you five things. So it was nutrition, right, exercise, right, mood, and sleep, and the cognitive game. So we want to make sure you're getting enough sleep, you're eating right, you're exercising, that your mood health is okay. Can we go back one, one more question with the sleep? If you can't fall asleep and your sleep is so important to you, at what point do you use a, a medication to help you? Which, which outweighs the other? Right, well, I'm not a doctor, so I can't talk really about medication, but I would definitely, if you can't fall asleep, sleep is really important. There are a whole bunch of natural things on the market that you could utilize also, and the, the doctors are actually talking about it, like melatonin and different things. Some people have too much chatter in their brain going on. So you have to figure out, sometimes people, I, I'm a TV watcher because I need to shut my brain down and I'll fall asleep in five minutes with the TV on. Learn what works best for you. Some people listen to music before they go to sleep and it shuts that down. They have different things on the market like um, sound machines or different things um, that people have created that help people who have difficulty falling asleep. It's like a droning noise that goes on and on and on. And I tried it on my son and he actually fell asleep. Star Spangled Banner, yeah, because it clears the chatter from your brain. She says the Star Spangled Banner three times and she falls asleep. So try it, we'll all be patriotic. <laughs> Yeah? Yeah, what if it, you fall asleep easily, but like every hour or two you, you awake it, then you go back to sleep, but you're awaking constantly during the night. Is that still a restful it's a, sleep? It's, you, if you're, you're sleeping, are you waking up exhausted? Are you waking up? You are? You are. I would no, talk to you doctor. No, I'm not waking okay, up so exhausted. Okay, so then you're okay. I mean, most people get up during the night to go to the bathroom. Yes. You know, so I mean, it, it's normal. It's, you know, if you're up for two hours after that, that's not so good. But if you're up for 10, 15 minutes, a half an hour to get back to sleep, that's okay. So, and if you're waking up feeling tired, something else is going on. You should check that out. Again, the five things again are nutrition, exercise, mood. Mood, sleep, and the cognitive stimulation. So let's get to that because I want to play these games with you. Okay, so a couple of things you can do. Shop in a new grocery store. Go to a different grocery store than you normally go to. You have to find the things in a different aisle, okay? Write with your non-dominant hands. These are things like you could do without going and buying the luminosity and doing all these other things. Learn a new language, okay? Introduce two senses when doing everyday tasks, like share a meal and use only visual cues to communicate. So don't talk to each other and communicate to each other through other, but it sounds silly. But it works. Okay, play games. Now let's play these games. Let's do this. Okay. So, okay. So, I'm going to talk a little bit now about the different parts of the brain and what it does, but with each one, I'm going to give you some exercises to do. Okay. So, executive function. Okay, so they all work together to help a person achieve their goals. So, managing time and attention, paying attention multitasking, planning, organizing, all of that is involved in the executive functions. 
Okay? So what do you do? In your packets, I gave you something that's called trail making. Now, trail making is like they use this in the neuropsychological exam, so he hates that I give this out. But it's like you're matching from like A to one, two to B. So you're, you're, you have to find and track. You have to keep track of where you're at. So that's a game that you could do. There's a letter symbol in there where you have to take the symbol from the top and find the letters at the bottom. Okay? And you don't have to find it now. It's in there. But, and they sell so many things at Barnes & Noble that you can get that would help with this too. Okay? A mixed up recipe. Okay? So, put organizing and putting things in order in this recipe. Obviously, the one cup of flour belongs up here. The mixed eggs belongs down there. Putting things all back together. Playing games with yourself. You could make this. You could take a recipe and make this. So you could get a little group together and make it for each other so you're not using your own recipe. And you can make, you could, you could reform the recipe and then you also give a present to somebody because you give them a recipe that you love. Okay, so these are things that you can do. Okay, paying attention and attentional difficulties. Okay, so let's look. Who can see? Could you see from the back? This should be big enough. Okay, what's that word up there? There you go. What's the next word? Teacher. Notebook. Notebook. Pencil. Very good. Very good. Okay? So all of these things are, are games that you can buy in Barnes & Noble. These are called anagrams. Anagrams are game words that are mixed up and in the newspaper or Barnes and Noble, you could go online. They offer so many free things online. Okay, so let's play a little game. The game is called Buzz. So how do we play the game? The game is where I'm going to start. I'm going to say one. You're going to say two, three, four, five, six. When we get to seven or any number that has a seven in it or is a multiple of a seven, we say buzz. Okay, ready? One, say two, three, four, five, six, seven. Then it goes back. Eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, buzz, buzz. Right. 15? 16. 19? There you go, okay? Games like that. You could sit and play it with your friends. You could play it in the car while you're driving with somebody. I want to give you practical things that you could use in your everyday life so it doesn't become a chore, but it's fun, okay? Okay, so then there's a... Change the number instead of seven, five or something. You could change it to five, you could change it to three. It's harder with three, you keep going back and forth. You have a lot of buzzes there. You could change it to nine, you could change it to whatever you want to change it to. Okay, so now, what about these? You could change one letter in each word to find a, the name of a food bread, milk, butter, meat, and the other one, I think, yeah, yeah. You guys got it. Okay. It's going to be B. Okay, so who here sometimes feel like they have a swampy brain, like they have slow thinking or they can't think straight? That's normal. Really normal. Okay, it takes you longer to complete tasks. So, okay, so these are really easy games that you can play anywhere while you're in the shower, anywhere. So think of as many things you could think of that are the color red. Now, question being is if you time it, if you time it and you track your progress, then you're, try, you're helping with that slow thinking. Okay, because it's not taking you all day to think of something, but you're, you're, it's taking you, you're doing it maybe for five minutes or 10 minutes, okay? So as many things, go ahead, who could tell me? Yeah. Color that's red, that, that's apple, that. tomato, what? Red sign. Tomato. Fire engine. A light. 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 A light.
Also, how many uses can you find for a paper clip besides holding paper? <coughs> Earrings? Bookmark. Bookmark? Fixing jewelry. Key. Fixing jewelry. Tie for a tie clip? Fixing jewelry? You could pick a lock if you're a thief. Huh? Cleaning out the Oh, cleaning out the what? The collar? Oh, the little holes. That's a good one. For what? Zipper yeah, if you, if you lose your zipper. Yes, to reset electronic devices. Change the time on the clock. So this is what I'm talking about. Think of as many things you can do with a dime. As many animals as you can. Name states. Name cities of states. Just challenge yourself. Okay, so who here, I asked you before, that word, right? You're like, oh my God, I know her name, I know her name, right? We all have that. This, this word finding issue, you forget the word. It's like, sounds like, smells like, tastes like. Okay, so what do we do for that? Get a group of people together. Start saying the alphabet. Start the alphabet? I do, yes, it does help. Yeah, the alphabet helps. But let me give you some cognitive things that you can do so maybe you won't have that happen to you as much. Okay? So, okay, so things like mind benders. Okay, so listen to this mind bender. A woman shoots her husband and then she holds him under water for over five minutes. Finally, she hangs him. But five minutes later, they both go out together and enjoy a wonderful dinner. How can this be? Could be a dream. That's not I. That's a good guess. Wishing? Wait, who wishes their husband dead? She's a psycho. What? Yes, she took a picture of him. She took a picture of him. She shot her husband with a camera, right? She held him underwater, because remember back in the days we used to develop pictures? Okay, right? And then she held him up. <laughs> right? Okay, so, okay, this one's a little bit more tricky. There are two plastic jugs filled with water. How could you put all of the water into the barrel, into a barrel, without using the jugs or any dividers, and still tell which water came from which jug? I'm sorry. What, color, what color water this. Color, but then when you pour them in, they all mix together. Don't pour them in. Just pour the what one would be? Yeah, well, they're both filled with oil and water, but that would be a good way. <laughs> right, but you have to take you have to take the water without. It says without using the jugs or any dividers. You can put food coloring. Right, but when you mix them up, the blue and the red is going to make. Bingo. Put them in separate jars. You could, that is, we're getting a little closer. What did she say? She said put one in at a time and investigate, but technically they both have to be in there at the same time. So they're separate barrels. No, you can't have a divider in the barrel. It's one barrel. Add oil to the whole jug. You can't have to be out of the jug. Put the light or put the first. One is water, the other is oil. Yay! Freeze both of them, actually. You freeze both of them, and you can tell which one. Then you can't Okay, but you but you did it. You see, it doesn't. It honestly doesn't even matter if you get the answer. It's more rewarding if you do. But just the process of thinking about these things is what you need to do. You get it? Yeah, we get it. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> And then there's something else called word fragments or runonyms, okay? These could, you could also look it up on the internet. Okay, so happiness is not a destination. A destination. Yep, there you go. Okay? It's a method of life. And the art of love is, I have the answer to you. It's something of persistence. Here, I have a few 
I think it's a labor. Is it a labor of persistence? Oh, you know what I brought for you guys to show you too? Okay, so look at these. Okay, so I remember as a kid, I had a book of these things. I think they're called doodles, right? They're called doodles. Okay, so what? What do you? What is this? What do you think this is? A tree. It could be a tree. What else could it be? A TV antenna. What else? Spider. An umbrella upside down. A bird. A bird. A spider. A spider doing a handstand. How about that? Okay. A design on clothing. It could be a clothing rack. A tie rack. A tie rack. Okay, so things like this, you could make your own. You could make your own. Okay, because look at this one now. What about this? What about this? Four dots on a Peas in a pod. Bowling balls, peas in a pod. Candies. Traffic cars. Wheels of the train, marbles. Four right? Four. Could be four ants going on a picnic and one is racing there, right? Three plus one. Right? Okay? So all all of these things, just doodle on a page, just something that doesn't look like anything, and find something that it looks like. Okay? Challenging your brain, that's it. Okay. Oh, we got to get that, right? Okay, I'm going to find that for you, but I, I want to, I know you guys we want to. Oh, you got it? What was it? The art of love is largely the art of persistence. Very good. Is it? The art of persistence. Good job. <laughs> okay, so find the homographs, okay? So what's the relationship between Locke and Piano? Key. Ship and card. Deck. There you go. Deck. Tree and card. You got it. School and I. You got it. Pillow and court. Case. What? Case. Case. You got it. Okay, so games like this, and like I said, all of this stuff is a bit, these are called homographs, where you have to find the connection to. There's a great book called Games, the book of games, and they have like hundreds of volumes probably now, and they have all these fun games in it. I know you mentioned Lumoscopy, you know, that's a free app. At the Luminosity? Yes, it's a free app. Yeah, there are different apps that you could download with memory. She's saying Luminosity has a free app, but but it doesn't give you like the full Luminosity like program you would have on your computer. Okay, so things like this. I actually found this on the internet. It's called the Sunday Afternoon Quiz. Okay, so I know. So wait. Okay, name one spot in which neither the spectators nor the participants know the score or the leader until the contest ends. Boxing. Is it boxing? I don't know. Probably. Yeah, boxing. No, they have. They don't swim around. I have my teacher. Don't remember that. I don't remember it. Yeah, <laughs> well, you got it. It's boxing. Yay. I heard it before. Okay, so what famous North American landmark is constantly moving backward? There you go. Okay. Niagara Falls, he said. But this is something I just found on the internet. So. Okay, perspective memory. Let me just go back because this is kind of important. So perspective memory is a memory for actions you want to take in the future. How many of you forget to take what you're supposed to take with you when you leave the house? Okay, okay so it's, and how many of you are forgetting doctor's appointments or things that you were supposed to remember? You're like, oh, I only need these five things from the store. I got it in my head. And you get to the store and you got three, but the other two, you just don't even know what it could be. Okay? Multitasking is a major cause of pers perspective memory failure. Okay? 
So when we multitask, we all do it because our lives have become so busy, so busy between the internet and phone calls and we don't have to go home anymore and return those phone calls. Now what we do is we make them away home, okay? And we don't have that downtime. We don't have any time to think anymore, okay? So multitasking is a big problem with that. So what do we do? Okay, so we use external memory aids such as a calendar or cell phones. A lot of people put reminders with alarms on their cell phones. Avoid multitasking if it's something that you really have to remember. You need to do it right then and there or it won't be done. Or write it down where you're going to see it. Okay, avoid multitasking. I always thought that multitasking actually stimulates different parts of the brain at the same time. It does. It does. Oh, I agree. It, de it definitely does. But what I'm saying is if you need to remember something, don't do it while you're multitasking, okay? Because if it's something important, like if you just got off the phone with the doctor and the doctor said 11 o'clock on Friday, okay, and then you go to your pot and then somebody else calls, I promise you you're not going to remember 11 o'clock on Friday. You're just not. I wouldn't. I wouldn't. I had to call somebody back yesterday because in three seconds I squirreled. I just totally forgot if it was a 12 or a 12.30 appointment. So you have to do it right then and there if it's important. But multitasking is great as long as it's not for something that you need to remember. Okay? Okay. So carry out any crucial task. This is kind of what we're saying now instead of later. Create reminder cues that stand out and put them in a difficult like spot that you're not going to miss it so if you need something to take with you i either put a yellow sticky on my front door or i put it so i will trip over it if i walk out the door okay so if you're going to leave it on your kitchen table but your kitchen table is in the back of the house and your door is over here you're it's not coming with you it's just not okay Okay. So, we already spoke about ways to improve this perspective memory. So, this is an example that, that I'm going to give you. So, if you're having trouble remembering to mail your letters, put the letter under put the letters under your keys. So, pair it with something that you have to take. So, if you have a bag that you're walking out with, put it with the bag. Okay. And like I said, you know, visualize. You can visualize your mailbox. But I just like, you know what? If you need it. Put it somewhere where you know you're going to take it. Go ahead. I have a game. I subscribe to Sudoku. I can't get the hard part, so I'm doing the, the medium part. Should I go to the hard part and fail, or do I learn enough to? Is the purpose to just exercise? Challenge your brain not to the point of frustration, because frustration will create stress. But challenging your brain with a medium Sudoku is perfect. If you want to substitute, like to become good enough to do that's not important. So you know what? Keep it out and take time with it, and maybe do the medium ones. Keep the keep the other one out and take some time with it. Don't feel like you have to finish it right away, okay? Because you don't want to be frustrated, but you want to do it to the point that it's challenging. If the medium ones you're doing like this, then you need to step. Okay. So then take and but don't also be your own worst critic. And, and allow yourself to make mistakes or not to get to that level if, if that's not your speed. Okay, so this is, could you, see, could you all see these boxes here? Okay, so this is about imagery and spatial processing. So you have to kind of form a mental image of which of these pictures would, would be that box. The answer is actually two, it's actually C and D. I know it's hard to see from behind. Yeah, it's actually C and D in that one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because it's, just, it's flipped over, so if you flip the box, it could go either way. I think they made a mistake, but it is C and D. Okay, so which puzzle piece would fit in there? C, 
C. Top, uh, top right. Upside down. Yeah, the course is going to rotate it. C. Yeah, it's not. It is. Upside down. C. 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 C.
We welcome her today with her husband, who is a neuropsychologist. So the two of them together, and we thank them so much for being here, and I'm sure they're going to tell us a lot of things that we won't forget. <laughs> Hi, thank you so much for having For dinner on Shabbos, <laughs> remembering who we went to school with, remembering what happened a year ago. Those are the kind of things that before we start to develop memory problems, get entrenched. And someone mentioned that the brain is like a computer, that what gets stuck, what gets put into the computer typically stays in the computer. And that's true unless we have a disease process that, that destroys that. The problem as we get older is that the hippocampus doesn't work as well, so getting information from short-term memory, new information from short-term memory to long-term memory can be a problem. It's a part of normal aging, and Lisa's going to talk about this, it's a part of normal aging, but there are disease processes that are involved that can be pathological, and we can have pathological changes and, and uh, pathological changes to our ability to form new memories. Okay, so let's talk about what's normal and what's not. And also, you know what I forgot? I forgot to point out that in your handouts, the page right after that front page is a notes page that kind of follows along to the presentation. So if you want to take notes or, you know, we all need to write down things to remember. So if you want to write something down, I gave you a little outline. And much more uh, in-depth um, issue than, than what we're able to cover here today. The cortex is the covering of the brain. It's the outer part of the brain. It's where, the, it's where most of the work that we think about takes place, uh, higher level functionings. Um, it's where it, there are different lobes of the brain. The frontal lobe is associated with movement, but also with reasoning and planning, what we think of as higher level functions. Uh, other lobes are the parietal lobes, uh, are associated with um, orientation, movement, recognition, perception, occipital lobe, is back here, it's, a, it's involved in visual perception. And then the temporal lobes, uh, which are involved with um, auditory, taking in and, and recognizing and associating auditory stimuli, but most importantly to what we're talking about today, the temporal lobes are integral to memory. Um, I'm not sure if there's a slide about this, but let me touch on something the rabbi mentioned a little while ago. The difference between short-term and long-term memory. As we get older, and someone made this point, as we get older, our memory functioning does decline because, as the rabbi correctly pointed out, brain cells, just like cells throughout the rest of the body, don't function as well, and some of them die as we get older. Now, someone... Me. I'd like to introduce my husband and partner, Dr. Stephen Essig. Um, we are lucky enough to have him here today that he's not seeing any patients this morning. So hopefully the two of our brains combined will help all of your brains. So today we're gonna to talk about brain games and I know you wanna learn all these strategies and techniques that will help you remember and learn new material and we're gonna cover all of that. But I also felt that if I didn't give you a background on the brain and how it works, as we heard towards the end, the rabbi was talking about a little bit and a lot of you had really good questions in addition to some other things that you can do, I'd only be giving you one-fifth of the puzzle. So I'm gonna give you the whole puzzle, the rest of it briefly, and then the brain games a little bit more extensively. Okay, okay so first, as I said, we're gonna talk about the brain a little bit, and I'm gonna hand the mic over to my husband, Dr. Essig, who's gonna, he's, He's the expert on the brain, so. I was told I was just here to schlep the computer and everything. <laughs> I didn't know I was speaking. Um, so we're, gonna, we're just gonna really give a very brief overview about how the brain works. It's obviously a very complex 